So <clears throat> keep trying to get all the technology to work here. Uh, my apologies for lecture two, which somehow didn't get recorded, but uh, this one should be, at least everything seems to be showing that it will be. We'll see how that goes. Anybody doing a day in the life at PSU today? Recording everything? No? No video cameras here? Um, I recorded my commute, which was uh, kind of fun this morning. We'll see how that ends up turning out. So <clears throat> without further ado, since yeah, this really is lecture three, not just lecture two, uh, <clears throat> we'll start out with our clicker questions for the day. Um, I did actually upload them, uh, the scores from last time, even though they're not going to count. Um, MOF5, all host cells are infected with at least one virus, at least two viruses, at least five viruses, 63% or 99%. And again, please feel free to talk about this with your neighbors. That's part of the idea here. And also remember everything from last time, all 48 hours ago. Hmm. Yeah, it's counting down now. <laughs> You've got two answers. <laughs> yeah, there are, well, I think that that's, no, no, there's, there's actually one, one best answer here. Believe it or not. <laughs> so, um, what do we think? Let's look at the results. Um, all 40 votes, uh, actually let me move this over to the other screen so you can actually see it, that might be a good thing. So, um, at an MOI of five, <clears throat> all host cells are infected with at least one, at least two, at least five, or 63% or 99% are infected. A number of people mentioned that they thought it might be A, that seems to be our, what do they call it again for multiple choice? Um, distractor questions, the distractor question. Um, the key here is that it's all host cells. It's actually not all. It's going to be close to all. So that means that E is the correct answer. Um, does that make sense to people who want me to discuss it more? No? Yes? Huh? Clueless? <laughs> Sorry, I'm not sure I quite follow the question, but sort of, I guess the, I'll paraphrase it, I'll try and, <laughs> try and understand it. Um, but basically what it means is that, you know, on the you know, average, as it were, if you're talking about, you know, geometric mean, that's going to be five. But there'll be quite a few with, few with four, quite a few with six, and so on and so forth. That's the whole idea of talking about multiple particles, the whole idea of the Poisson distribution. And so that's, so that's why it's not... Now, at least five, because there'll be plenty which have fewer, and there'll even be a few, relatively few, but still a few that have none. Uh, so that's that's the message here with these <coughs> MOIs. Okay, does that make sense? Why we need to do MOIs? Because we're going to be talking a lot more today about why you need to do that in terms of one-step growth curves, etc. So we can close these up. Oh, hang on. No. One day I'll figure this out, right? You would think. I've been doing this for long enough. Um, so <clears throat> just quick review here. We just talked about um, you know, sort of one-step growth curves, Poisson assays, uh, how were viruses discovered, just as little things that went through filters that caused disease. So that's probably why they got a bad rap. But it was only about 100 years ago. Um, are viruses alive? Maybe, maybe not. Depends on your definition of life. As I mentioned to somebody in office hours, I think day one, my 
standard obfuscation, so playing politician here, is that viruses are part of life, at least part of life as we know it. Um, so I can completely avoid that answering that question. Um, all kinds of really amazing things you can do with viruses, um, really wonderful tools for understanding the hosts that they infect, and that's what most of virus tools have been used for. But there are other things, using viruses to treat bacterial disease, using viruses as nanoparticles for completely different applications, batteries, sort of, you name it. Uh, important plaque assays. How many of you are in the recombinant DNA techniques to mutant viruses from Hell Lab? Um, you should be seeing your plaques um, very soon. I looked at the plaques from Wednesday's lab. They look awesome. Um, really nice. Um, so hopefully the ones from Thursday's will be good too. Uh, and then the whole idea of the one-step growth curve, and we'll talk much more about that today, but basically you want to have a synchronous infection of as many cells as possible. Again, with the plus-on distribution, you're not going to get absolutely complete infection, but you'll get pretty close. Um, and then you can follow a whole population of cells that are infected, and the way that you do that is by doing black assays over time after this synchronous infection. So any questions sort of on that last lecture before we move on and, and talk more about some new stuff today? So uh, most of the time today we're going to talk about virus structures, and you know, this is one of my favorite virus structures. It's A, beautiful, and B, I discovered that virus. Um, but also talk a little bit about replication strategies. And this is, again, this is very broad brush kind of thing, but I'll in terms of thinking about virus replication, um, there are really six different ways that viruses replicate, also called the Baltimore classes of virus. So we'll go through those in, in quite a bit of detail. And then we'll move on and talk about how to determine structures of viruses. And in this case, it really should be structures of virions. I didn't put virions up here. I said the wrong thing. Um, so how do you do that? Basically, electron microscopy is really the major way that the structures of virions are determined. Um, to some extent, X-ray crystallography, um, but it turns out X-ray crystallography is really, really hard um, working with these viruses. And this particular structure here is actually from an electron microscopy reconstruction. Uh, a lot of virions have icosahedral symmetry, like this one, and I brought a number of examples of icosahedral symmetry today. Um, in the past, I've had people make icosahedrons for this class, but since I've been teaching it for over 10 years, I've had rather too many of them. These are just a few that I hung on to, although that one's mine. Um, turns out icosahedral symmetry is a geometrically really good way to package the maximum amount of volume in the minimum amount of surface area. So it's really just math in terms of why viruses, or virions, I should say, have these particular kinds of structures. So talk a little bit about triangulation numbers. It's a really nice way of understanding how these particular icosahedrally symmetric structures come together. Look at some examples of envelope and assembly. And we may or may not get around to virus taxonomy. This is how you name various different viruses. This is a god-awful mess, unfortunately. Um, I, next time I'll bring the the book, the latest taxonomy, it's about 2,000 pages and still incredibly controversial. Um, but the idea is really trying to move away from a lot of what viruses were originally called. That's all the taxonomy is, is trying to give these things names. It was all based on disease, but of course, as we all know in this class, right, many viruses don't cause disease. So um, how are we going to start to name some of those? Um, turns out to be an interesting, <clears throat> difficult question to answer. Uh, in terms of these general replication patterns, I mentioned the Baltimore classification. So lots of people will talk about the different classes, Baltimore classes of viruses. Um, and it's really all about two things. One is what is the nucleic acid, the form of nucleic acid that's packaged inside the virion, and how they get to messenger RNA. As we mentioned well, the last time or the time before, um, all viruses depend on cellular translation. So they've got to make messenger RNA somehow. And one of the things to me, I think almost coolest things about viruses in general, is they've got a whole bunch of different ways of making messenger RNA, which is really fascinating. Unlike us poor, boring creatures, uh, they've got lots of different ways to come up with messenger RNA. 
And so that's really how a lot of viruses are classified again in this Baltimore classification. We'll look at that in much more detail. Um, as far as structures are concerned, um, anyone know what that acronym is for? K-I-S-S, -S, keep it simple, stupid. Um, so basically for virions and even the very largest virions, those are the Mimi viruses. Well, actually that's not quite true. Mimi viruses are close to the largest ones. There are Pandora viruses that even bigger have totally crazy structures. But some of the largest virions actually have exactly, well, not exactly the same, but very, very similar kinds of rules in terms of how these things get put together. And so an icosahedron is about as close to a sphere as you can get. Um, and again, that maximizes volume relative to surface area. Um, helical symmetry is another way to package virions. And we looked at that at the very beginning. We talked about various different virions. And again, the whole idea of helical symmetry is very easy using a small number of subunits that are all interacting with each other in almost exactly the same way to give you a nice structure. So icosahedral and helical symmetry, again, which we'll talk about a lot more in more detail. So first, let's talk a little bit about virus replication. We talked about this before when we talked about the one-step growth curve. Remember, we had our <clears throat> synchronous infection right here a latent period, and then all of the viruses are produced. Um, we're ba basically going to ignore, for the most part, this bit here at the end. Um, all the interesting stuff from a molecular point of view is going on here in the eclipse, and to some extent, this difference in eclipse and latent period where you're getting cell lysis. And so that's basically shown up here. You have binding to a receptor on the outside of the cell, and just terminology-wise, the receptor is what the virion is going to bind to. And these can be all kinds of different things. Basically, anything that's on the outside of a cell has been used by some virus as a receptor. So we've got proteins, lipids, carbohydrates, etc. Um, basically, anything you can think of on the outside of the cell, a virion has evolved to bind to that and use that as a way to find the right cell. And that brings up another term um, that a lot of people talk about, which is tropism. So virus tropism, when you talk about virus tropism, that's the kind of host cell that it infects. And just the other day in the recombinant DNA lab, we were talking about herpes viruses, and these are neurotrophic viruses. And so they'll go to nerve cells. Um, and so we'll have lots of other different kinds of tropisms. So once you have binding up here, then the virion, or more importantly, the virus genome, needs to get inside the cell. And usually cells don't want to have virions getting inside them for pretty obvious reasons. And so the process of getting that genome inside the cell is something which is really pretty specific to viruses. So um, some of my favorite are the drills, we drill through membranes. That's our friend bacteriophage G4 that literally does kind of make a drill through the membrane. And when we talk about virus entry, we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Quite often there's some damage that happens to the cell membrane. That's dangerous, um, not just for the cell, but also for the virus, because the virus depends on the cell actually being able to replicate to make more virus. So if it's going to make some kind of damage, it's got to be pretty minimal in terms of the damage or something that's just repaired pretty quickly. Uh, many cases, certainly for the animal viruses, there's some kind of fusion event that takes place. This is really easy if you're an enveloped virus. So an enveloped virus has a lipid on the outside. Lipids like lipids. So you can fuse your lipid with the lipid of the host. And that way you release the capsid, which is on the inside. That happens really quite often. And that's basically what's shown um, up here at the top, where we have this fusion digging place, the virions released, and then your genome needs to get out. Um, but still then with the capsid, with the proteins around the outside, that still has to be degraded in some way in order to get the genome out. Yeah? Uh, on the uh, lipid fusion, are they doing any stunts with snare proteins? <laughs> so the question is, um, when you have fusion happening, are there any stunts with snare proteins? Um, the answer is yes, and we'll get back to that. <laughs> when we talk about um, fusion of enveloped viruses. Any questions on, on that. And then once you have your genome in, that's of course the important thing, 
um, then you need to start making viral genes. And this is the process of what's called early gene expression. So this is the first set of genes that are being made. Um, these are almost always going to be genes whose products are important for replicating more of the virus genome. Not surprising. We'll talk a lot about early proteins and late proteins <clears throat> as we move along. And even already here, um, we've got our early enzymes as they're being produced right here. So that's got us to this point. Move a little bit further along here. Again, mostly genome replication for early proteins. Then you make the late genes, late gene expression. Almost always these late genes are going to be the ones which are important for structure, putting together the virion. So early genes genome replication. Those genomes are then used to make a lot of the late proteins. And again, we'll talk about these, basically talk about, you know, as I mentioned before, most of the rest of the course after next week is going to be individual sort of virus families. So we'll talk about the early genes in each of those families. We'll talk about the late genes in each of those families and how they're being regulated. Um, and then once you finally have all of these late proteins put together, you then have to make them into virions and those virions get out. There are lots of different ways that virions get out. Um, lysis is sort of the classic way that you see the poor cells that have been infected by bacteria of HD4. Lots of virions accumulate inside the cell, then poof, um, the cell explodes and all the virions are released and they go off and do their thing again. Um, that's great if you have a whole bunch of host cells around and not too many viruses, of course, if you're virions, I should say, uh, but if you've got a whole bunch of virions around and cells that are not very happy, i.e. they're getting blown apart all the time, it's kind of a problem. So um, many cases, this is also true for a lot of the eukaryotic viruses, is they're just released by little blebs of viruses coming, our virions coming off of cells. Um, and so that's really quite often the case. Cell-to-cell um, -cell interactions um, for plant viruses, almost always the transfer inside the plant is from cell to cell rather than a new infection coming from the outside. And these are those um, whole processes. So any questions on sort of this overall thing? This is where we're going to be going over again and again and again. One great way to think about these things as far as exams is maybe get something like this and use this as a backdrop for thinking about the individual viruses that we're talking about. So um, really nice way of, of reviewing and thinking about all the things that we have there. So let's talk about the <clears throat> different classes of viruses. I'm hopefully kind of, again, beating the dead horse on this one. Um, but it's very important. People use these things all the time. And it's really about the RNA, messenger RNA here, um, which gets translated. Again, it's always going to be cellular ribosomes that are translating this messenger RNA inside the cell. There are lots of different things in terms of genomes, sometimes different nucleic acid, basically any nucleic acid you can think of is packaged in virions and then gets made into messenger RNA. One important concept here is the positive strand versus the negative strand. The positive strand just means this is the RNA which when translated makes protein. And we'll see later there are actually some cases where You've got that RNA, which is both negative and positive, but we'll avoid that for the time being. So um, positive strand, single-stranded RNAs. So here, this is what you need to get. How do you get to this particular point? Well, the easy way to think about it is if you've got double-stranded DNA that gets transcribed, normally by the regular transcription machinery, into your messenger RNA. So that's pretty easy. DNA-dependent RNA polymerase that you need to do that. That's um, usually a cellular polymerase that does that. So that really makes sense. Um, some of the other weird things are some of these RNA viruses that package positive strand, single-stranded RNA. That kind of makes sense, too, because as soon as your genome is released inside the cell, that can be translated. So 
that makes a lot of sense. It's a kind of a problem, however, because you need to make more of that positive strand RNA. So you need to make negative strand RNAs to make positive strand RNAs. Um, but that's a pretty straightforward process. In fact, a lot of the simplest viruses use this replication mechanism. On the other hand, there are quite a few virions that package either negative strand, single-stranded RNA, or double-stranded RNA. And these clearly have to have a way of making that messenger RNA to translate into proteins, because negative strand means nothing. You know, the translation machinery in the cell can't do anything with it. So these virions all have to bring with them a RNA-dependent RNA polymerase to make the messenger RNA that needs to be then used to make proteins. So anytime you have negative strand, and it turns out the double-stranded RNA viruses as well, um, all have viral RNA-dependent RNA polymerases in the virion with them. So they have to be bringing it with them because the cell doesn't have RNA-dependent RNA polymerases, at least not RNA-dependent RNA polymerases, which can make long enough strands to make a whole virus genome. So these are the RNA viruses up here at the bottom. We've got our double-stranded DNA viruses. And then one of my favorite kinds of viruses are these guys, which package single-stranded DNA. Packaging single-stranded DNA is weird because, okay, you can't use it as your template for translation, because it's DNA, it's not RNA. Um, and you can't even use a cellular normal RNA polymerase, DNA-dependent RNA polymerase, because those don't work on single-stranded DNA. So you have to make these into double-stranded DNA. And then once they've been made into double-stranded DNA, now you've got a DNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which can transcribe that into your messenger RNA and use that messenger RNA to make proteins. Um, seems like really kind of a bass backwards way to go about making more of your genome and making more of the virion, but it turns out these are incredibly successful um, viruses. Um, potentially the majority of viruses out there in the environment are these single-stranded DNA viruses. So um, we'll talk about that, and in fact, uh, my graduate student, George Kaysen, is gonna be talking about that because that's what he's working on for his PhD project, yeah. Well, I think that that would be really effective, though, because then you don't need to, like, contrary to the um, single-strand RNA, right, because you could probably just use a cellular machinery to just keep reusing that initial insert, or do you still need multiple volume of that um, single-strand DNA? Do you get what I'm saying? Like a template, like you could use that as in a template form? So I, I think, I, I think, I'm trying to paraphrase your question here, is that, um, couldn't you just basically say this is one of the templates that a normal DNA polymerase would be using? That makes perfect sense, but what do DNA polymerases also all need? Templates and primers. Where's a primer here? There's actually none whatsoever, which makes it really hard to deal with. Now, we'll talk about how that gets taken care of later on because clearly it works. <laughs> but that was a question over here, too? You kind of answered it. Okay. <laughs> um, and then, oh yeah, sorry. Uh, is the, the virus virions that bring the polymerase with them, is it intact when it enters the cell? Like, is it all kind of ready to go um, by the time it's inserted into the cell? Yeah, so the question again, just just, just repeat it so we get that um, on, on tape, as it were. Um, God, how many people actually remember using tapes? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the... <clears throat> The polymerase, the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, when it comes in, it's got to be active right away because if it weren't, there's no way you could get this um, single-stranded uh, RNA that you're going to need to translate all the proteins that you're going to need after that. So yeah, so those are clearly some protein which you have to have and bring with you, which brings me perfectly, thanks for the lead-in, <laughs> to this last set down here at the bottom. Um, these are the retroviruses. And in fact, this is why David Baltimore, with these all these classes are named after, got his Nobel Prize, um, was because he actually found a particular enzyme that was active in virions, which took single-stranded RNA and made DNA 
So it was literally finding that enzyme which uh, made that whole process. So there were these positive strands, single-stranded RNA viruses down here at the bottom, uh, which somehow weren't being used directly. They were going through this DNA intermediate, and that DNA intermediate then became double-stranded DNA and got transcribed. And so and that was exactly also the same thing, is there are very few cellular RNA-dependent DNA polymerases, or reverse transcriptase activity. So also, in all of your <clears throat> excuse me, retroviruses, any of these class 6 ones, they are all bringing their own polymerase with them, and that polymerase is active. And in fact, that's a, curiously enough, um, David Baltimore and also Howard Temin were working on these RNA-dependent RNA polymerases that they found in virions first. And then they found this one down here at the bottom and said, oh, we're, we're trying to find an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase for this RNA virus, but it's not there. We have this DNA polymerase. This is really bizarre. <laughs> and so that's where, where that whole thing came in. Um, so this is just another way of looking at that. This is, in fact, a image basically from David Baltimore's 1971 paper. Um, and again, it's all about the messenger RNA. Um, the class numbers here are what he came up with at the time. Um, class 1 are these double-stranded DNA viruses. These are, one could argue about whether these single-stranded DNA viruses are more common, but between these two, these are the most common viruses that we know of. Uh, and, of course, these double-stranded DNA viruses, some of them are sitting in our genome. So class one are these double-stranded DNA viruses, which can transcribe directly. The positive-strand DNA viruses are the class two that have to become double-stranded DNA and go to messenger RNA. The positive-strand RNA viruses can be used as messenger RNA directly, but they've got to make this negative-strand RNA in order to make more of the positive strand RNA later on. And that single RNA that comes in with a positive strand RNA virus is not enough. You can't make enough of the virus proteins from that one single genome. So you have to undergo this step here in the middle. Double-stranded RNA, you can go straight to messenger RNA, but usually um, you're replicating it as well. The negative strand RNAs down here at the bottom, um, these actually are great in terms of making messenger RNAs because if you've got that RNA-dependent RNA polymerase in your virion, that can be making your messenger RNAs immediately. So it's a really quick way to do that. Um, and then the, you know, the funky retroviruses up here which start as positive strand RNA, then become DNA, single-stranded, then double-stranded DNA. So at risk of doing this far too much, um, we'll go through and look at each of these individually. Um, again, the class ones is the double-stranded DNA viruses, which can be transcribed directly into messenger RNA. The <clears throat> single-stranded DNA viruses, that single strand becomes double-stranded, that double-stranded becomes messenger RNA. The class threes are, in fact, the double-stranded RNA viruses. I'm not going to expect you to remember all of these um, numbers for exams, but I might expect you to remember them on a clicker question at some point in the near future. Um, <clears throat> so these class twos make the messenger RNAs either directly because they can just pull those two strands apart. One of them has a um, positive strand RNA activity. Class fours are these positive strand RNA viruses, single strand RNA viruses. You need to make a negative strand. From that negative strand, you make a whole bunch of messenger RNAs. The negative strands, again, really straightforward. Those can be copied by their RNA-dependent RNA polymerase into a messenger RNA. And the retroviruses, our positive strand RNA, becomes negative strand DNA. That gets made into double-stranded DNA, which, of course, then can be made into messenger RNA. So, questions on Baltimore classes, etc., <laughs> how all of these things work relative to each other. So, since everybody's happy about it, let's have a clicker question. <laughs> so, <clears throat> which of the Baltimore classes of viruses do not use RNA as an intermediate in replication? Two, three, four, five, or six. Again, please feel free to 
talk about these things on each other. Consensus is good. Okay, um, everyone seems to be pretty happy about this, so we'll show our results. Uh, yeah, it's going to be our class twos because those are single-stranded DNA, goes to double-stranded DNA, goes to messenger RNA. But in terms of replication, which is just making more of the viral genome, uh, that <clears throat> needs to have no RNA intermediates in the process. Any questions about why the rest of these are wrong? Or incorrect, maybe, is a better way of putting it. Yes, no, okay, so. <laughs> ah, speak now or forever hold your peace. Um, let's um, select the proper answer here to make sure everybody gets points, the people who actually answered it properly. Um, which reminds me, I did upload the scores for a last time on the D2L, right before class. You probably haven't seen them yet. Don't check them now. Uh, but, and I will also do that for these. The software is now much better for getting those points together. Okay, so are there, this is basically chapter one of the textbook. Um, everybody happy with pretty much everything in there? Um, now we just have that question, yeah. So for a simple way to remember, the Baltimore classes is mm -hmm. all about basically just start with singular double standard DNA or RNA of positive or negative. So like these three bits of data will give you yeah, so basically the permutations are RNA versus DNA, single-stranded versus double-stranded, if single-stranded, positive versus negative. So you've got three binary choices to look at. Um, the only confusing one are the retros, because they're single-stranded, positive-strand RNA, but are using DNA intermediate. So, the exception, the exception that proves the rule, as always. Okay, so any more questions on this stuff? Otherwise, we will um, move on and talk about <coughs> virus structure. Again, this is the um, KISS approach. Um, the real reason for this, um, again, just seems to be very simple geometry. Um, and one of the problems that Again, I mentioned, oh, here we go, molecular biology, it's bringing it up again. Um, with nucleic acid, is it's really pretty inefficient size-wise. If you think about it, you need three nucleotides to make one amino acid in the genetic code, um, and you need six to make two. They're not overlapping codes. Um, DNA in and of itself is pretty darn big, um, and this is one of the reasons that people thought that actually proteins were the genetic material to start out with. Um, so all viruses are using nucleic acid, their genetic material as well, but they have to make a virion with proteins, and the more nucleic acid you have, the larger the virion is that you have to make. So the smallest amount of your genome that you can use to make the largest possible structure is going to be the best way as far as most virions are concerned. Yeah? Do they condense their genetic material at all? Oh, the question is do um, the viruses, they condense the genetic material? So basically inside the virion, is it condensed? 
That's a really, really good question. Um, there are a couple of cases that it's known for. Um, turns out it's some of these bacteriophages. There's not a particular condensation per se, but it's crammed into the head structure with one of the strongest motors known to anybody. And so it's really tightly packed, just jammed in right next to itself. Um, there are some viruses that use histones to package their nucleic acid. Um, there are also some cases, and this particular one is really interesting, where it uses positively supercoiled DNA to compact the DNA that's present inside the virion. So lots of different ways. And again, it's the same kind of problem that we have with our cells, is that we've got this you know, two meter long, you know, if we'd stretched it all out, that we need to compact down into microns or 10 microns inside our cell, inside the nucleus. Yeah, there's a question over here. I was just gonna say the book mentioned that the double-stranded DNA does hijack the host cell's histones. Yeah, so. Yeah, and some that do that. And we'll talk much more about that. Those are particularly the, um, well, it's really the polyomaviruses that mostly do that, SV40. Um, in fact, that's partly how we know so much about histones, is in studying the viruses that package <laughs> their genomes um, in histones. So um, we know a lot about how histones interact with DNA from, from those, from studying those things. Um, so um, again, basic idea, you want to have small number of proteins, relatively small proteins, in order to get a large enough um, structure. The next problem that virions have is that they're outside the cell most of the time, at least all the virions are, but still once they find the right cell that they want to get their genome into, they've got to be really unstable and release their genome. So this is what people call the virus capsid paradox, is that the virion has to be very stable when it's on the outside of a cell, but as soon as it interacts with its receptor, it's got to be really unstable. And there are lots of different ways that viruses have evolved um, to do this. And we'll talk much more about each of the individual ones. There seems to be lots of different solutions to the same problem. Um, then we'll talk about icosahedral symmetry. Um, main message with icosahedral symmetry, again, is it's a way to get pretty close to a sphere with very similar subunits, and in some cases, absolutely identical subunits in their interactions with each other. And I'll talk a little bit about quasi-equivalence. That's how you can go from having your soccer ball that's got five-fold axes of symmetry that also some that have six-fold axes of symmetry as well. And we'll talk much more about quasi-symmetry. Don't worry. Um, we'll get there. So how do people know about these um, virus structures? Basically, it has to do with these wonderful instruments. Um, this is, in fact, a picture of the FEI Techni F20, which is in the basement of Science Building 1, um, that our lab uses um, on a regular basis. I broke it um, oh. about a month ago. It's only a $2 million instrument, uh, but fortunately it was fixable, which is good. Uh, so <clears throat> this is what's used um, pretty standardly for looking at what's called negative stain. That We'll look at some examples just on the next uh, slide. In terms of getting the high-resolution structures, those really pretty pictures, like the STIV one that I keep showing you all the time, um, those are usually done with larger microscopes. Um, and this is an example of one of those here, the, the Titan Cryos. Um, this is sort of the latest, greatest microscope uh, made by a company based out of Hillsboro, um, a place called FEI. Um, and OHSU has um, one of these as well. Um, as I said, yeah, this is about a $2 million instrument. This is about a $10 million instrument. And I always joke that the smaller things are that you're trying to look at, the bigger the microscope. Um, and so uh, this particular one, this one you can sort of see based on the computer. That one's about 12 feet high. So <clears throat> negative stain, this is the sort of classic. And the reason we use it is because it's really easy in terms of looking at individual virions. Basically, you take your virion suspension, how many virions you have, and you put it together with some kind of stain. Uh, stains that we usually use are heavy metal stains, particularly uranium, tungsten. And the reason for that are these are metals which are going to absorb electrons and absorb electrons really well. And so what that means is you have something which is dark here, and the dark is where we have the stain, and the light is where the stain has been excluded. And so that's the negative stain. And so here we've got some nice <clears throat> bacteriophage virions um, with heads and tails. Here's a nice long filamentous 
virion, um, and then some of the other virions here. This is the adenovirus um, virion here as well. Um, these are influenza, um, two different actually kinds of influenza virions that we have here. So that's the easy, fast, straightforward one, the one that we use all the time because it's incredibly straightforward um, and something that we can um, do very easily. There are a number of other techniques, and these are basically getting to higher and higher resolution and are harder and harder to do. So the easiest of these is here, um, thin sections. And so what you do here, instead of just taking your solution and putting in some stain with it, you now take whatever you have, and in this case it's an infected cell, and make really, really, really thin slices. Um, and when I say thin slices, these are on the order of hundreds of nanometers um, slices, um, what's called an ultra microtome for making these really thin slices. And then you can stain those in order to get some kind of electron density. Again, electron microscope is what you need for all these things. <clears throat> and then you can see in this particular case the individual virions um, right here, which are now being positively stained, um, in this case, in fact, is HIV, um, with the envelope around the outside and then the nucleocapsid on the inside. So those are things that you can use standard electron microscopes for. Now you need to go to the really big boys. Um, these are what are called cryo-EMs, so cryo in ice. We'll talk about this a little bit later on. These kinds of structures, which had most of the virus structures we're going to be looking at um, for the rest of this course, um, are not the structures of a single virion. They're reconstructions of many, 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 many pictures of virions, which have been averaged together in the computer. We'll take a look at that in just a second. Um, if you're really, really, really lucky and your virus is really, really, really small, um, you can, in fact, crystallize it and do pretty standard X-ray crystallography. And that gives you the highest resolution, but there are very, very few virions um, that people have been able to actually crystallize. Yeah? On cryo-EM, are you using water ice or other uh, substances? We'll get to that in just a second. Yeah? Um, this is for the virion phase. Mm -hmm. Will you also explain a little bit about some of the other phases of the virus life cycle, how we're able to so the, the basic question here is, again, okay, you're using these to look at virions, of course. What about visualizing all of the other parts of the virus life cycle? Well, here, um, with this thin section, you're looking at cells as well as virions. And so you can image some of that here. Um, the difficulty arises when you're looking at you know, transcription or replication. These are things which are very, very hard to image. We're getting better at them than things called super resolution microscopy, the way beyond the scope of this course. Um, but there are ways of looking at some of those things. But they're a lot harder to um, identify and take a look at. Yeah, so let's take a quick look at <coughs> cryo-electron microscopy or single, <coughs> excuse me, particle reconstructions. Um, and so here, you do use water ice for this particular process. But the critical aspect of using water ice here is you use vitreous ice and not crystalline ice. And so the dif difference is not really that critical for this course, but basically the problem with normal ice, your ice cubes, you know, what you have in your cocktail, um, these are formed as crystals. As soon as a crystal forms, it's going to mess up whatever other structure happens to be there. But water is this really amazing molecule. Um, and if you cool it really, really, really fast, and when I say really, really fast, this is thousands of degrees per second, then it will form an amorphous phase, which is non-crystalline, and not mess up whatever else is in it, because it's not forming all of these crystals. Um, and the way you do that is you take your sample and basically throw it really, really fast into liquid nitrogen or ethane or something like that. And there are literally machines that do this um, for you. So once you have that, now you've got lots of virions in amorphous ice, and you take a whole bunch of pictures of them. Um, and some of the main cryo reconstructions now, people use tens of thousands of particles um, to look at this. And they call it single particle reconstruction. Um, but it's really averaging a whole bunch of other particles in the process. And so 
You have pictures of all of these virions in all kinds of different orientations relative to each other. And then really powerful computer software will separate each of these from each other, line them up all relative to each other, which is a lot easier if you've got something which is clearly very symmetrical. And then basically average back out the structure that you end up with here at the end. Oops. Sorry about that. Um, and so here's going to be that structure um, at the very last part. Um, if you're lucky enough to get a crystal that forms of your virion, then you can do <clears throat> pretty classic X-ray crystallography. Um, really, really hard to get crystals of virions. So, uh, but again, if this does work, you can get a X-ray diffraction image, which then you can <clears throat> transform through all kinds of really exciting and fun math, reverse Fourier transforms for the most part. Uh, and then you end up with an electron density, which is this screen basically here on the outside, all of the blue cross-linked bits here. And then, since you know the sequences of the proteins that make up the capsid, you can fit, if you've got good enough electron density, the sequence of your protein into this electron density, which will give you this particular structure that you end up with here. These are, if you think about it, now this would be one of your capsid proteins fitting together into a whole virion, and that makes it a rather challenging structure to actually visualize. Um, I wanted to then really quickly jump out of this and talk about um, something that some of my buddies at Autodesk, anybody know Autodesk? Computer-aided design um, software. They're starting to use some of their tools to now be able to visualize some of these virions. So this is the <clears throat> structure. He says it's Zika. I don't believe it's actually Zika, but it's a related Flavy virus here um, that they've now put in some cloud computing. So you can literally play around with this, if I can get it to actually work, um, in really kind of real time and look at each of the individual atoms. I'm going to zoom in a little bit here. Um, those are the, oops, that's a bit too far. Um, so these are those, that's the structure of this. We're actually looking through some of the pores of the virus here, or the virion through to the other side, um, and using a lot of the you know, new technologies for <clears throat> visualizing some of these things. And I'll give you the link to, to this particular thing so you can, you can play around with it. It's, it's pretty mind blowing. Uh, but it only works if you have this kind of molecular structure. And so there aren't very many of those that have that. Okay, so these are the main ways that people are getting structures. More and more structures now are coming up from the cryo-EMs. And in fact, this is a structure which was derived from one of those cryo-EM structures. Yeah? This might be a basic chemistry kind of thing, but could you say a couple words on what it means to make a crystal of a virus or <laughs> okay, yeah, so, so the, 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 how, do you, how do you go about crystallizing a virion? And, and yeah. what does that mean? And what, what, is, what does it mean? Um, so the way that you do it is you get very concentrated virions, and you put them together and hope, and this is a lot of hope, <laughs> that um, they all are going to <clears throat> assemble with each other in completely regular crystalline lattices. And usually they will take one look at you and lift up their middle finger and <laughs> form this amorphous aggregate. Um, so you need to play around a lot with different conditions and, and basically certainly for a lot of these virions get very lucky. Um, the other thing to do is to try a whole bunch of different conditions, a whole bunch of different virions. And again, but it's mostly about being lucky and getting them to assemble in a crystalline lattice. Because once they're in a crystalline lattice, this is really key in terms of the X-ray diffraction. You can't get diffraction from a single particle. You can only get diffraction if you've got multiple that are present in a crystal lattice, because they're going to keep reflecting all the electrons. And I can you know, send you some more links on, on how these things actually are done. Uh, but the basic message is you take really concentrated virions, you put them together, and hope they form a crystal. <laughs> <laughs> um, and wait sometimes for, for really long periods of time. Okay, so once you get this, 
um, now you can think about the actual virions. And usually your negative stain is close enough. Your cryo gives you a little bit more information here. Um, so the, again, the basic message here is smaller is better, um, at least as far as virions is concerned. Um, <clears throat> so as I mentioned before, um, a lot of this has to do with the fact that DNA is really crummy and RNA as well as a really crummy genetic material. Um, it's basically just too darn big. Um, and in some cases, a third of the genome is set aside for, and in some cases almost half the genome, for the capsid protein. And if you have just one capsid protein, that's not going to be able to make a virion unless it can interact with other proteins, and usually it's interacting with itself. And so let's look at a couple of cases of that <clears throat> right here. This is what happens in helical virions. Each of these commas, I have no idea why they pick commas <laughs> for each of these structures, but that's what they did. Um, each of these commas, you can see one of these is going to interact with all of these guys around it in just the way, same way that this guy interacts with all these guys around it, which interacts with these guys in exactly the identical way all around it, etc. And if you wrap this structure around so that this guy is interacting with that guy, just the same as this guy is interacting with that guy, you end up with a helical structure. And helices are, are really nice this way because you can have these repeating units and that form out really nicely and give you a pretty long piece. In fact, this is probably why DNA has a helical structure because they're very similar subunits that are all interacting with each other in extremely similar ways. And so helices are great. The big problem with helices is just like the problem our chromosomes have. What's the problem that our chromosomes have? Probably the biggest problem other than compacting them. Ends. What do you do with the ends? And that's um, also exactly the same kind of problem that you have with helical variants. What do you do with the ends? Uh, what's the best way to deal with ends? What do bacteria do? They circularize things. So what's a circle in three dimensions? A sphere. <laughs> so that's what many virions do in order to not have to deal with the end problem. Um, and <clears throat> that brings us to icosahedral particles, but really much more importantly, icosahedral symmetry. And so this is why I bring all of my models with me here. Yeah? Does anything make a helix into a torus? So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we need a higher math here. Um, or, you know, Mebus strips or anything like that. Um, to my knowledge, there are no toroidal virions. Um, in theory, you could have them, but probably has to do with the assembly and disassembly process, which would be more challenging potentially that way. So the whole metastable state of the virion. And you know, people, you know, if you don't know what a torus is, don't worry about it. Don't go <laughs> oh yeah, you can go online. That's, that's, that's true with everything these days. Right? Okay, so <clears throat> the idea with that icosahedron is it's not quite a sphere. It's just close to a sphere. Um, and again, an icosahedron is just something that's got 20 sides um, around it, and it has these very specific three different kinds of symmetry that it has. So we'll start out with our twofold symmetry, and all the twofold symmetry means is you can take your icosahedrally symmetrical particle, rotate it, there we are here, 180 degrees around this particular point, and you get the same thing back again. So that's our what's called the two-fold axis of <clears throat> symmetry. You also have three-fold axis of symmetry, which is now you rotate 120 degrees, you get the same thing back, same thing back, same thing back. And then you have a five-fold axis of symmetry, which is right here, where you rotate 72 degrees, and you get the same thing back. So those are icosahedrally symmetrical particles. You can take um, your threefold, um, any multiples of those, of course, are going to count the same way um, in terms of your axes of symmetry. So <clears throat> that's what happens just with icosahedrons. Um, icosahedral particles, um, why do you have an icosahedron? In theory, you could use a tetrahedron or a cube, because again, these are the same kinds of surfaces on the outside, but they're just too darn small. So <clears throat> here, icosahedral symmetry, 
Um, you have fivefold, twofold, and threefold axes of, of rotation. Um, again, I, I love the, the soccer ball here because it's a really nice way of thinking about how many different axes of rotation you're going to have. Um, the fivefold axis of rotation are where you've got your nice little pentagons, um, and your <coughs> threefolds are where we have hexagons in this particular case, and twofolds are between those two. If you think about the simplest way to put together an icosahedron, which has triangular faces on it, triangles need what? Three of something. You've got 20 faces on your icosahedron, three capsid proteins that are going to come together there. So the very simplest icosahedron is going to have 60 of these <coughs> capsid subunits. People also call them capsomers. Um, and again, this is now shown with all these commas on here. So here are five of these that are interacting with five of them here, which are interacting with five of them here, etc. Um, and uh, this reminds me that I need to make sure that the textbook that has these figures in it um, shows up um, over there. Uh, there's a really nice database here that the link should actually work to because it gives me a link now. Thanks, David. Um, to the Viper database um, at Scripps. And in fact, these are the guys who we worked with to solve the structure of, of my virus uh, a little bit later on. Uh, one thing to think about, however, and I'm going to skip this here, icosahedral symmetry, which means that you've got fivefold, threefold, and twofold axes, is not just going to be the case for icosahedrons. An icosahedron, a regular icosahedron, is literally just 20 triangular faces. Um, anytime you get actually beyond that, and that's what this actually is, this is not in fact as icosahedral symmetry, but it's not an icosahedron, because it's got these extra hexagons in it. If it were just pentagons, then it's going to have <coughs> a, it's going to be a true icosahedron. Some virions do have a pure icosahedron that's associated with them. And these are what are called the t equals 1, or triangulation number equals 1, and we'll get the triangulation numbers in just a second. Um, here is that particular virion. It's the Calpi mosaic virus. It's a very small virion with a very small RNA that gets packaged inside it. And one of the really nice things about this image, in fact, this is one of those few virions that people got lucky with and were able, in fact, to crystallize. Uh, if you look at these <coughs> individual yellow dots in here, each of those is an individual gold particle. Each of those has bound to one of the capsid subunits or capsomers that are putting together this, this whole virion. And you can see those <coughs> down here. Um, each of these capsomers are colored in slightly different colors here. Green, red, blue. Okay, that makes sense. That's the easy one. So let's um, talk about quasi-equivalence. Um, as I mentioned, um, Calpi mosaic virus is really, really small. The genome, and in fact, well, it's kind of funky, but that particular virion only packages a little over 1,000 nucleotides of RNA. So it's basically too small. So how do you go from a icosahedron, which is just all this five-fold symmetry to something which is a little bigger. And that was kind of the you know, obfuscation with the soccer ball. How do you get something which is a little bit bigger? Well, the way you get something which is a little bit bigger, still using the same subunits, is instead of having things that are just at five-fold symmetries, you now have the individual subunits that are also at six-folds. And so I drew my little uh, commas on here as well. So we've got our commas here around the five-fold symmetry. And then commas here around the six-fold symmetry. And that's basically shown here as well. One of the really nice things about this is that you can fit these <coughs> pentagons, which are always going to be at your five-fold axis of symmetry. You can add hexagons either between them here in sort of a triangular form but you can also add extra ones and basically get to larger and larger particles. And this was all shown theoretically 
Um, if you have just a flat sheet of hexagons, all you need to do is put 12 pentagons into that, <coughs> and it will form into a closed three-dimensional structure. And that was shown by Casper and Klug in the 1950s, um, and a number of people have, have followed up and, and looked at that. But the basic idea here is we now have our subunits, all the capsimers, which are going to be just adding an extra hexagon between each of the pentagons. And if you go back and think about the surface, and I can give people links to this, but I don't think it's absolutely critical. Um, the way that you can now describe how these things are all being put together has to do with the so-called triangulation number. So that's why we talk about t equals 1, t equals 2, t equals 3. It's a really nice way to describe these icosahedrally symmetrical particles. Um, this particular one here, and people can come up to it and take a look at it um, later on, is a classic t equals 3 quasi-equivalent icosahedral structure. How do you get to that T number? How do you calculate T numbers? This is the, well, Poisson distribution. You might want to know how to calculate. I'll give you the formula if you need it. Um, I would expect you, however, to know the formula for calculating T numbers. It's really easy. Um, so <clears throat> T is equal to H squared plus HK plus K squared. Okay, fine, that's nice. But what the heck is H and what the heck is K? So <clears throat> what these are are moving from one five-fold axis of symmetry, nice green pentagon here, to the next five-fold axis of symmetry by the most direct route. And H and K are just two different, <clears throat> I don't know, vectors, I would call them then, between the five-fold axis of symmetry. So let's take a look at this T equals three icosahedral particle here. Here's one five-fold axis of symmetry, there's the next one down here, which I can get to eventually. Um, and we'll see a different one here. So we'll go from this five-fold axis of symmetry to that five-fold axis of symmetry. To get there, you need to go to one center of a hexagon. Now you need to change direction, so you're changing axes. So that's going to be a one followed by a one. So H of one, K of one. Up here, we have, oops, come on, that's the problem, I need to shut off the rest of my phone for this. Um, <clears throat> here, we have our t equals 4 icosahedron. Here, we have a five-fold axis of symmetry. Here's a five-fold axis of symmetry. We need to go to it through the six-fold axis of symmetry. We now go one, two, we don't have to change directions. So our H here is going to be 2, our K is going to be 0. So here we have an H of 1 and a K of 1, because you've changed directions, change axes, whereas here we're staying in the same direction. We don't have to change our vector at all. So this guy is T equals 3 because it's H of 1, K of 1. So H squared, 1 squared, plus HK, 1 times 1 is 1, um, plus K squared. Here, our h is 2, our k is 0, so we've got just <clears throat> a t equals 4. h squared is 4, h times 2 times 0 is 0, 0 times 0 is 0. That makes sense? Are you going to expect us to be able to like, look at an image and then tr like, trace that out? <coughs> Does this look like something like that? <laughs> So, look at an image and trace it out. So, this is copy chlorotic mosaic virus, a classic T equals 3 icosahedron. The key here, if you are given something like this to look at, is to find where your pentamers are. And then, find where the next pentamer is, and see where the hexamers are. So, to get from this pentamer to that pentamer, you need to go 1, change direction, go 1. Okay, so what's this T number? So the easier way to do this is to literally count them. And so there's our five-fold axis of symmetry. Here's another five-fold axis of symmetry. So we need to go from here, one, two, three, 
four, five, change direction, and go one. And you can do those calculations over the weekend because it's 10.05. <laughs>